Can everybody hear me? Sound good? Awesome. Off to a good start. Uh, cool. So thanks, everyone, for coming to my talk uh, titled Unpacking and Packet, How to Detect uh, Remote Execution of Offensive Security Tools. Um, I know it's close to lunchtime, so I'm getting hungry as well, so I appreciate the time. Uh, who am I? My name's Tyler Bullman. I'm an incident handler at a company called Red Canary. Uh, I like to describe it as ghost hunting and computers to uh, find evil and um, figure out why computers misbehave and do bad things. Uh, before that, before joining incident handling, I was actually the first technical support engineer at Red Canary. And then before that, I worked at various MSPs doing a lot of different IT work, uh, help desk, desktop support, stuff like that. A um, little bit about me, I'm a girl dad. There's a picture of my two girls. One is a dog and one is a human. Uh, also really enjoy jujitsu, which is just wrestling in fancy pajamas. And I enjoy coffee so much that I put it in all caps. A uh, quick overview of what we're going to cover. Um, we'll define what is in packet. Next, we'll uh, discuss why should you care, what's the significance here. And then we'll cover briefly cover detection and response. Uh, and then after that, we'll start to talk about tracing it back to initial access. After that, some f future considerations. And then we'll end with a and a Cool. What is in packet? And Packet is basically just a collection of Python classes that are used to target Windows networking protocols. Uh, it, the project used to belong to SecureAuth, but I guess earlier this week, Fortra announced that they're undertaking the project that, uh, going forward. Uh, Fortra is formerly known as Help Systems. Uh, they have everybody's favorite uh, adversary emulation tool called Cobalt Strike. Maybe they'll call it Cobalt Impact or something like that, who knows. Uh, but it's essentially a low impact tool, very versatile, used to attack all the things, can do enumeration, discovery, capture hashes, move out laterally throughout the environment, uh, perform some privesc, and of course what we'll talk, to bit, talk about today, uh, remote execution. And also on the right there, it can attack those, targets those protocols, Kerberos, Windows Secrets, WMI, etc. Show of hands, who had, or who's uh, used in packet but only in a testing scenario, like pen test, stuff like that. Has anyone encountered it on like a surprise pen test or malicious use? Okay, cool. Um, so why should you care? Uh, from my perspective, at least at Red Canary, we normally see this as testing activity and testing only. Um, so it's usually used in um, common scenarios are AD assessments, internal, internal assessments, uh, assume breach, stuff like that. Very limited in scope, um, but they're trying to accomplish the same things as an adversary. Um, just the se severity of what they're trying to do is slightly different. Um, and that's why under the uses, they're meant to look the same except for adversary execute malware and deploy ransomware. Um, slightly different outcomes there. And then for the examples, pen tester, I'm just gonna pop calc remotely, see if I can execute some code uh, on, an, on a remote endpoint. And then the other one is just, <laughs> not just, but uh, executing Whispergate, so I'm gonna destroy the MBR and then leave a ransom note. So. And packet use essentially exists on two ends of the spectrum. Uh, when it's testing, it's good. We kind of just shrug it off. Uh, but in, when it's adversary use, it can be bad and really lead to, to worse things pretty quickly. Um, so it kind of blurs the lines and kind of lulls us into a false sense of security. Uh, additionally, it also differs from other th threats, at least uh, from my perspective. Uh, when we talk about com commodity malware, uh, using GoodLoader as an example, if we look at that command line there, we can intuitively, intuitively derive a lot of information of kind of what's going on pretty quickly. Uh, we see WScript executing, ex ex executing uh, this JavaScript file. That JavaScript file was in a zip file. And the name of the file uh, looks to be related to some kind of search query, possibly. 
So really quick, we have a lot of useful information that kind of drives our investigation. Uh, next, we have expo exchange exploitation via a web shell. Uh, with that process execution there, uh, W3WP, or as the cool kids say, whoop, uh, spawning CMD or, or PowerShell. That kind of looks odd, kind of looks very suspicious. We can kind of infer it might be related to a web shell. Uh, if there is command line uh, information available that starts with echo, we can, that kind of uh, points us more in the direction that it is a web shell. We can start looking at IS logs to pull in additional context. So kind of intuitive, we can derive a lot of information from there. Oops, forgot my memes. So we like the first one, it's easy to investigate. Second one, easy to investigate too. Uh, but then we have remote execution uh, within packet, and we get this weird command line that is a bunch of gibberish uh, initially looking at it. So harder to investigate, we don't really like that. Uh, really quick, just wanted to go over how I did my testing. Super simple, uh, at a high level. Uh, the data collection is just sysmon, and then I'm using Olaf Hartog's default sysmon config. And then we just have the default Windows event logs that are available. Uh, operating system, just a local Windows uh, 10 VM and Kali Linux. Uh, tools to kind of display this information, I use Eric Zimmerman's Timeline Explorer, and also uh, there's a suite of sysmon tools, and sysmon view is in, uh, in them. And then the scripts I tested, PS exec, SMB exec, WMI, and DCOM. So first we'll discuss PS exec. Um, it's actually not PS exec from sys internals. It's based off of a uh, remcom, which is basically just open source PS exec. Uh, connects to remote machines to execute commands using a name pipe. Uh, what is a name pipe? Uh, just allows for inter-process communication, uses client-server architecture to basically just transfer data back and forth. Um, cool, yeah, communicates over 445 as well. Um, so the event logs that it generates, there's four of them, uh, 4624, so for that one, we're specifically, specifically looking for log on type three, which is over the network, it's gonna contain uh, the compromised username and then the remote IP of the device that it's coming from. We'll also see 4672, so those special permissions that are granted to that uh, compromised username. We'll also see a lo some log off events, um, usually when the shell exits or when a command is uh, entered. Uh, and then lastly, we get 7045, which just is showing that a uh, service has been created. Um, this is kind of what that data looks like in Timeline Explorer. Uh, so the top red box is showing 4624 and 4672, and then we can see the affected user in this case is Bob. We have remote IP information, and then also that log on type three, just showing that it's occurring over the network. Uh, 4672 showing those special permissions assigned, and then the 4634 log off event and then if you look at the bottom, 7045, you get the display name of the, the service and also the image path of where that's pointing to. So pointing to that, that service binary that gets randomly generated. Uh, looking at this from Sysmon, we get this nice process hierarchy. So we get that service binary that, that gets created, spawns CMD, and then for general enumeration, I just did who am I and host name. So pretty easy to follow there. And then the sysmon events that it, that it creates, there's three of them that stick out, at least to me. Uh, system writing that service binary to disk and see windows. We get some pipe creation. Um, the name pipes are prepended with remcom, so just pointing more evidence towards that it is remcom and not actually PS exec. Uh, and then registry modifications. So the image path specifically pointing to that service binary. And then if we we're gonna go about um, querying or searching for this data, I have some pseudo detection logic that just at a high level takes the sysmon data and kind of puts it in kind of a query format. So we have system 
uh, looking for a file being created in C Windows. Uh, that, again, that service binary. Uh, service being created, that one probably will be pretty noisy depending on the endpoint uh, activity. So maybe false positive prone there. And, and then that pipe creation. So that uh, service binary creating uh, a pipe that starts with remcom. And then we move on to SMB exec. So pretty similar to PS, PS exec. Uh, this is actually based off of Eric Millam's SMB exec project um, from 2012, 2013, I think. Uh, his main use case was to get obfuscated Metasploit payloads um, to a remote endpoint, basically to evade AV. Um, this is, again, similar to PS exec, except it doesn't actually drop a binary to disk. Uh, but still creates a service. Uh, uses a batch file for execution, and then there's a temporary file um, that's there for the output, and then also communicates over 445. And then just like PS exec, it's gonna generate those same um, Windows event logs as well. Uh, so again, if we look at that in Timeline Explorer, we see Kind of similar activity to, to PS exec, um, but for the service creation, if you look at the executable info column, um, those are all of the commands that are being generated into, well, that's gonna point to the image path for the registry modification, um, but CD is, echo CD is when the, the shell first connects to the remote endpoint, and then, who am I? So that gets iter or updated in an iterative fashion. Um, so kind of interesting to see. And this is what it looks like in Sysmon from a process hierarchy standpoint. Uh, so services spawning, CMD, and then again, did the simple enumeration with who am I and host name. Um, so for Sysmon registry modification events, um, looking at the image path specifically, it's gonna point to not a service binary this time, but uh, a temporary file called execute.bat. So that's that batch file that's executing the commands. And then a temporary output file in the root of C. Um, by default, the service name for SMB exec is BTO, BTO, but you can change that uh, in the script itself, but a lot of people don't. Uh, and then the command line down there, I just wanted to point out the whole command line since it gets kind of cut off in the, the screenshot above it. And then file creation. So it's gonna create that execute.bat file in a C, C Windows temp. Um, and then the way it executes is kind of interesting. So if you look at the white box, uh, the bottom, or the bottom uh, red box is actually echoing the command into that uh, execute.bat file. And then the way it executes that is um, it spawns another CMD process, and then that CMD process just goes ahead and executes that BAT file. So that's why you see um, services spawning CMD, so that's gonna echo whatever command you're entering into that execute.bat file, and then a secondary CMD process will spawn to actually execute the, the batch file. So kind of interesting. And then again, pseudo detection logic for SMB exec. So uh, we have CMD uh, creating a file, execute.bat. And I put C Windows uh, underscore underscore output, but I actually didn't get a file creation event for it. Uh, and I'm wondering because that doesn't have a file extension, so something to look out for there. Uh, and then registry modification, again, with services being created. Might be noisy, might be false positive prone. Uh, and then command line execution, so CMD, which has uh, a CLI of that whole string there. And then next, we move on to WMI exec. So it's, let's say it's, can say it's the same as SMB, but it's actually stealthier. Uh, it doesn't create a service at all. Um, it uses Windows management instrumentation, uh, basically allows remote access to Windows endpoints 
Uh, a lot of system administrators or network admins uh, use it uh, to manage endpoints within, within their environment. Uh, communicates over 135 and 445 uh, for that initial shell connection, and then subsequent data is uh, sent over a uh, dynamic port through that port range. Uh, so for Windows event logs, we have three, uh, just like the previous two scripts, except for we don't get a service creation here, so no 7045 being created. Uh, so again, this is what it looks like in Timeline Explorer. Pretty similar to the previous two, except there's gonna be no service being created. And then from a Sysmon point of view, this is the process hierarchy. So we have WMI spawning CMD, and then whatever command you're gonna enter. Uh, and then for Sysmon events, we have a file being created. So if you look in the blue boxes, uh, see windows, and then a funky string of characters or numbers, uh, that is actually an epoch timestamp. So forensically, that's kind of nice to have because you get a uh, date and time of when uh, the execution occurred and also when those commands were going off. And then for uh, process CLI, just wanted to point out that CMD is, has, is executing uh, this command line here. So pretty unique. It's gonna proxy whatever command you're entering, so in this case, who am I, to that temporary file in that admin share, uh, and then spawn who am I in this case. And then just like the previous two, some high-level pseudo detection logic. So again, we have system creating a file, uh, that epoch timestamp in C windows, uh, some command line execution, so CMD, that has a command line of uh, that unique uh, string of characters there. And then a child process of WMI spawning CMD. Uh, kind of one thing to look out for the child process one. Uh, if you use WMI legitly in your environment, like that's gonna be the execution chain. Uh, I think SCCM also uses this as well. Um, then additionally, malicious word macros to break that parent-child process relationship also uses this as well. So some things to look out for there. And then DCOM, similar, very similar to D, uh, WMI, except it uses DCOM objects. Um, it supports right now MMC, shell windows, and shell browser window. And then this is actually based off of Matt Nelson's work that he's done for uh, DCOM lateral movement techniques. Uh, COM and DCOM, if you don't know, is basically middleware. Uh, it acts as a hidden translation layer between the operating system and applications to transmit data, basically. Uh, I also call it black magic because it works in mysterious ways. Uh, also communicates over 135 and 445. And then, yeah, for that initial connection, then sends additional data over a dynamic port. Uh, similar to WMI, it's going to generate those same three uh, Windows events. And again, looks pretty similar to WMI. Um, looking at it in Timeline Explorer. And this is what it looks like in uh, Sysmon. So we have mmc.exe, which is super interesting that it spawns CMD. And then again, executing those um, enumeration commands. Who am I in host name? As I was making this slide, I was actually thinking, how common is this in real large environments? Uh, something to kind of further investigate. Um, for sysmon events, we have a file being created. So similar to uh, WMI, we have a file being created in C Windows, and instead of a date time stamp, it just looks like uh, a date stamp uh, in an epoch format. Um, and then also the process creation, so MMC spawning CMD uh, with those command lines over there on the right. And then next we have some pseudo-detection logic, so pretty similar to 
WMI system creating uh, a file in C windows, uh, starting with underscore underscore. Uh, command line execution, so CMD having that command line of that unique uh, string there. And then the child process is interesting, MMC spawning CMD as well. All right, now that we've covered some detection methods for uh, understanding how those various scripts work and what they look like, we can look back at our alert from earlier uh, in a previous slide and kind of start to investigate it. Uh, this is something that I always remember whenever I start an investigation. I don't know if anyone has taken Chris Sanders investigation theory course, but I highly recommend it. So a, a question well stated is a problem half solved. So some things to start asking yourself to help identify scope and situ situational awareness. Um, since we just have one alert, this is gonna be uh, just affecting one endpoint so far. And then um, since we know the endpoint, we can determine, hey, is this actually a workstation or server? Um, workstation in this case. And then uh, what user or users are affected? In this case, we just have Bob, uh, who's been compromised. Uh, can we account for this endpoint? Do we know the system owner? Do we know um, the endpoint role, et cetera? Uh, yes, but just on the affected endpoint here. Uh, to cover situational awareness, uh, where are we in the incident response process? So currently, identification, since we've identified this kind of execution going on on this workstation, but we need to quickly move to containment and then remediation efforts to remove the threat. And then how far is the adversary within their attack objective? So they're already performing some kind of execution there. And then from that, what kind of assumptions can I make? Initial access has already taken place somewhere. User credentials has probably, probably been compromised. This could be coming from some unmonitored or rogue endpoint. Then I made this in packet cheat sheet just to quickly, uh, to help with triage as well actually. Um, so if we look back to this command line here, we notice the epoch timestamp after, after the admin share. And then looking at the cheat sheet, okay, this is actually uh, WMI. Uh, we should be looking for a file being created and see windows and then also um, some event IDs to investigate and sysmon event IDs as well if we have those available. And then also just wanted to include this um, since this is what each script looks like um, over the network. I just performed netstat on the remote endpoint that this was happening on. So PSExec actually creates four connections on 445. Uh, SMB exec only creates one on 445. And then WMI and DCOM exec kind of look identical. So they both connect initially on 135 and 445 and then submit additional data over that dynamic port. And then tracing back to initial access. So usually when it's a test, um, we don't really think about initial access because they're already on the internal network. Uh, they've been given an endpoint and user credentials probably. Um, so initial access is usually an afterthought. Uh, but when it's adversary use, uh, we kind of panic and try to figure this out quickly, uh, especially if it's on an unmonitored endpoint. So I like to ask, how did this happen? Where did it come from? Uh, in from my experience, I've usually seen this come from a rogue endpoint, uh, usually coming from some VPN service getting popped or a Citrix gateway, or in a rare case, there was a VoIP MyTel box that got popped, and it was coming from that, which was pretty interesting. Um, so then that leads us to think about other internet-facing services, so that's why I put those three techniques there for initial access, uh, external remote services, uh, using valid accounts, um, and then maybe exploitation of some public-facing or internet-facing uh, 
uh, web application. And I thought this uh, screenshot here was interesting. It's just showing the most common or top CVEs uh, exploited by Chinese APT groups since 2020. Uh, a few of those are VPN or Citrix services, and then half of them, I think, are remote code execution. And then everyone's favorite is at the top, Log4j. Uh, so I thought that was interesting there and something to, to always think about. Uh, future considerations, don't use Active Directory. Just use SneakerNet. That's it. Just kidding. You, you, you of course, use Active Directory. Um, but some things to think about. Uh, there's this really great Mandiant article where they go over um, a lot of great advice. So some things that they talk about are segmentation and disabling admin and, and hidden shares. That's a typo. Uh, and then further, we have, uh, if you're familiar with Atomic Red Team, there's two tests in there that you can use if you don't want to spin up uh, and pack it yourself. Uh, so segmentation. So when we think about um, our architecture, workstation to workstation, and then workstation to any non-DC or non-file server, we can consider uh, blocking incoming connections from SMB or RPC. Um, so that's pretty much what Impacket uses, or at least in this case, these, these four scripts. Um, additionally, we can think about RDP uh, if we use Windows Remote Management as well, and then those dynamic ports for uh, WMI. Again, this is just a consideration, something to think about. Um, you could legitimately break something if you <laughs> just block out these outright without testing, so. And then disabling admin or hidden shares. So these are some com common uh, admin or hidden shares here listed. Uh, at, uh, impact it usually abuses the admin share. Um, again, if you use like PS exec legitimately in your environment, this actually might break things. So something to consider there, always test. Don't just implement these without testing. Uh, that's the registry key for both uh, workstation and servers there. You could also create a service to disable these or use GPO. And then lastly, we have two atomic uh, tests from, from the art repo that you can test with. Uh, one's for executing uh, commands out of the local admin share and also WMI execution um, for remote execution there. That's it. Any questions? Super quick question. Uh yeah. That's, yeah. I think so, but that's, I mean, that's a really good question. I haven't really thought about that yet, um, but that kind of removes the scenario that you'd commonly use in packet for, right? You'd use it on a domain environment. Uh, to move laterally quickly, execute code. Um, I would think so, but I'd have, I'd have to do testing, but that's a good consideration, a, gr a great question. Bonus question. Um, on uh, Wimic being deprecated, I think earlier this year, uh, did you find shops that have it still around? Uh, and, it, and does Impact do anything with Wimic? Um, I... That's another good question. I haven't really noticed that or seen that. Um, I think the two main scripts I've seen used are SMB and WMI exec, but yeah, I, I've seen it still working in a test scenario. Um, so I haven't really seen like any issues with it not working. Does that help? 
Uh, my question was if uh, we'd like to test out uh, the material that you presented here ourselves, what would be the best place to start? You mentioned a few resources there. I didn't get them all written down, so I don't know if this slide deck is available yeah, or with the it'll, steps. Yeah, it'll, it'll be shared. Okay, thank I you. I can share the slide deck. Um, if you feel like spinning up a Windows domain environment, you could do it that way. Uh, or did like I did, just test it with a local Windows VM um, and then just run and pack it from like Kali or download the repo yourself. Does that help answer your question? Okay, cool. Yeah, my question, um, you, you, you had a list of IOCs for the, the various exploits. Um, how have you implemented it into a, a live environment, as I'm sure you have, but how noisy have you seen this turning on these alerts in conjunction with uh, legitimate events? And, and I know that's subjective per environment, but in general, what have you observed? Are you talking about the detection logic? Yes. Yeah. Um, so obviously, you want to tune and test uh, that detection logic, and every, every environment's different. Um, and there's also, since Impacket is open source, that, that code has been reused for like Vuln scanners or other legitimate tools that kind of inventory like AD environments. There's a tool called Block64 that actually does this. Um, so that's something to look out for there as well. It can be really noisy, but again, like from a vendor perspective, it's hard to know that you know internal environment context. But if you know your environment pretty well, like you use PXExec legitimately or WMI to administer things remotely, um, that's additional information and insight that you have to say, hey, this is actually normal. Um, so it would take some tuning and baselining to initially see like, hey, how often is this occurring in my, env in my environment? And then from there, trace that back to either, either if it's legit or not. That's how I'd kind of uh, handle that. Does that help answer your question? Cool. Cool, thanks everyone, appreciate it.